All right, here's a slice of the video the dad made uh, along with uh, CFTO out of Toronto. And I, I presume he had invited them on a flight. Um, I'll show you him later, but uh, basically this... There's a camera guy and then a guy named Dave Duvall who was a very long time uh, meteorologist, weather anchor at CFTO. Um, I read some. I read on Wiki that uh, he holds the world record, or did hold the world record, for the longest uh, continuous weather meteorologist job in media, which is 48 years. Yeah, it says here 48 years. He started uh, at that job in 1961. Um, anyway, so here's the initial inflation. Uh, this happens with the result of. Uh, at least one very large fan, gasoline powered fan. I think the ones dad had were, I'm gonna say about eight horsepower. Um, and he had two of them. I think they were similarly sized. So, I mean, um, I don't know the exact CFM of either of these fans, but it's a metric shit ton, there's no doubt about it. They blow, you know, hurricane force kind of thing. And that's what gives you the initial inflation there. It's usually the captain who's asking for, um, you know, an additional fan to be added. I think in a little bit here we'll see um, Roger uh, grab the second fan in order to get more air into it. You can't start blowing the hot um, into it until it's inflated up to a certain capacity. Until it's, um, and part of the reason of that is that uh, you run the risk of burning uh, holes in the side of the envelope. Um, if it's laying down too flat like that. So um, that's also why you have a little bit of gimbal action or um, you can adjust the uh, the propane valves in such a way that you can kind of aim it and, and not, uh, you know, burn the whole inside of the thing. As you can see, the balloon starts on its side, not just the envelope, but also the basket. and. Uh, once they get uh, some buoyancy and uh, it'll start to come upright and everybody's already loaded into the thing. We'll see that in a second. I'll re-describe that, but uh, yeah, there you go. You can see people are loaded in sideways and they'll stay there. Here's dad in the front uh, operating one of those fans, as I mentioned. And there's also a propane tank right behind him there. And that's the tank that only runs the um, inflation routine. So that tank will get disconnected. I don't think that they left it in the basket because the thing, you know, 60 or 70 or 100 pounds. So I think that's really just a tank that they have off to the side. It's not one of the four that runs the flight. That also helps to not have to burn a bunch of your fuel anyway just to get it inflated. Uh, you, can, you can get some of it off that uh, stationary tank. So here Rogers decided that uh, there's enough of an opening there that you can start to hit it with the fire. Dad pulls the fan away. And he also adjusts the uh, tank here and giving it a hand, you know. Some of these little sequences are a little bit out of sequence. Um, I guess Dad did the initial cut with the, with the video guy. And he was making basically a promotional video kind of thing. So he had his own reasons for, you know, this flight that we're about to go on. I sense it's a part of two flights because when it lands, it looks like it's much later in the day and possibly not this early morning flight. But uh, it's still, I wanted something that just gave us the general sequence of a uh, balloon flight. So you can see the mouth of that's open quite nice. Um, I can't remember whether Roger hits it with some more air or not, but uh, at least the opening's nice and round. Fully inflated, the balloon's almost 10 stories high. It's a pretty impressive sight. Uh, this is the 160,000 cubic foot model. Dad also had 140,000 cubic foot. Um, and the numbers don't sound a lot different, but uh, it's funny how uh, it was a much smaller balloon than this one. Possibly a little bit wider. It was stouter, you know. 
So you're just hitting it with the flame again. This is what, uh, you know, will start to put a bunch of hot air up at the top there and it will start to uh, start to rise. It kind of rises from the side at first. So that's where all the, you know, the hot air is collecting, but then it's traveling up to the highest point in the balloon, which at this point is in the corner. Oh, here we go. Roger figures he needs a little bit more. Uh, I don't know why he didn't just add, ask Dad for another uh, blast, but... Oh, yeah, I'll get them both out. Let's get them both out. Yeah, I think they were something like... I think they were 8 horsepower. Or maybe they were smaller and that's why they needed two. I'm not sure. I can't really tell from here by the engine. Maybe they were like 5 horsepower or something like that and the two is better. I don't know. Usually on a big balloon like that, if you want to inflate it with any kind of speed yeah you need something pretty killer i did sometimes operate those fans uh, when i was there working crew and also i've been this guy holding the side of it open and it gets warm there I, you know i think those burners were something like half a million btus each or something along those lines they pump out the heat there's no doubt about it you fry a chicken in there in about six nanoseconds I think this flight here was just uh, just after dawn kind of thing. This was early morning. I do have a section of the C CFTO um, weather program that mentions his flight. That was uh, Dave Duvall. And um, I'll show that in a different video. This one I just wanted to get a description of the flight character. So here you see it going, here's where it's got enough buoyancy and uh, there's enough heat in the right place to get the thing upright. He's still blasting it to her though because you need to get, uh, you want to get the balloon straight up ahead of you. If there is some wind you don't want it leaning in. This is also where you can easily burn the side of the uh, envelope with the angle of the dangle there. So he's really trying to get the balloon right overhead so that he doesn't have to worry about any of that and you can hit her proper. Now here's where some people come hands-on which means that they're, uh, they're making sure the balloon can build up some buoyancy and some lift um, and they hang on to it. They're not putting all the weight on it right now, but essentially just making sure it doesn't take off on um, prematurely. The pilot is usually telling people either hands on or hands off, and he'll do that repeatedly. Like he's judging how much lift he actually has, and he'll say put hands on in order to uh, for him to build up a little bit more lift, and then hands off when it's time for him to actually lift off. So at this point, that's mostly what. Uh, this other guy's here securing the, one of the lines. That's mostly what the people standing around side of it. They're just adding uh, additional weight in order to make sure that the thing doesn't go off on its own. You can see the external tank's still connected. I think that happens until the very uh, last second. This is a loud section of the thing, too, because when those burners are going, they're, uh, especially when both are there, like lit up like that. Noisy as fuck. Okay, here's a guy. I think he's gonna disconnect the external tank. I think that's what he's doing. And also, you see, they got more people hands on now, and they're actually putting their weight on it. And uh, Roger's gonna start to bounce here in a sec. And I think it's just to give him some idea whether he's got any sweep or sway, whether he's off the ground even a little bit. Yeah, you can see the trailer and the recovery. Those are the recovery vehicles. They follow the balloon to where it's going using the radio to figure out where the hell he's at. And um, they collect in the general area of where Roger says he's uh, thinking about landing. It's a tricky job because uh, it's only so many county roads that go the direction that you want to. And of course, we end up usually landing in a field. So you got to take all that trailer and van and truck out to the field where we've uh, landed. Um, yeah, there's Dave Duvall on the uh, right there with the blue balloonery hat. Pretty sure Dad let him have that, you know, promotional and all. Anyway, yeah, he's the meteorologist who was invited to uh, come see this. And, of course, his, his camera guy is doing the footage here. 
I think he is a pilot himself. The wiki doesn't say, but at some point he mentioned that uh, uh, he usually only flies planes that have wings. So I have a feeling he's got his pilot's license. And at some point, it won't be in this video, but I think it's in the uh, the longer one that I'll show as a separate project. Um, he gets the job of reaching over to grab uh, the leaves from the top of a tree. Uh, quite often it was Roger the pilot who would show off like this. So this is not long for uh, takeoff. Not sure if they've already disconnected that external tank or not, but I hope so. There we go. So that's where he uh, puts that line onto one of the internal four tanks and uh, now they're on fully internal power. Where the hell dad is at that point? I think he was on this flight. Maybe he gets on at the last second or I just can't see him. He is a little short, but not that short. Alright, here's he's sitting there with balls. This is where he'll probably uh, tends to get her off the ground and I should have looked up those burners, but I think Dad had told me years ago they were half a million BTUs each or something like that. Yeah, I see him there bouncing around a little bit. I think that's just giving some indication whether he's still planted or, or has any lift with, you know. Even if he were off by an inch and a bit, you know, he'd feel this way a little bit, feel the bounce. He kind of calls off this corner guy here rather abruptly, I uh, noticed. I'll come up on that in a sec. But yeah, by the time he intends to take off, uh, that's when you got to get the fuck off. You really don't want to go up with it, that's for sure. Yeah, there he goes, hands off. And you can see it's up on a wee angle, but that really that's just uh, that's just tilted in um, in with the wind. Oh yeah, Dad is out on the right. He's out in the corner. It's camouflaged. Now this was the basket uh, and burner assembly, I believe, that was involved in the accident I told you about in New Zealand. We called it an eight-person basket, four on each side plus pilot, or with the addition of a pilot. The New Zealand crash crashed with 11, which meant pilot plus 10, which you could put in that balloon, but it'd be a little, be a little tight. It had enough handles for it, for sure. You travel uh, at the same speed and completely in the direction of the wind, so when he's not hitting the burner, it's dead silent up there. And there's no wind noise because you're traveling along with it. It's rel relative to... So it's, it's quite silent, quite an experience. There it is over the buildings at the Hockley Valley Resort there. That's probably taken from the uh, ground crew, is my guess. As I mentioned, they have that van and a trailer and a truck, and they uh, follow it around. It's pretty easy to see it in the air, of course, but uh, like I say, you got to know the area pretty well if you're going to be a part of the ground crew that's going to find it, because you have to have some ass idea of where you're at and where the balloon is headed.
Typical altitude uh, for the top side of the flight is uh, 700 to 1,000 feet. It can go quite a bit higher, but you've got to be careful because you, in different layers you get different wind. And uh, typically the pilot will put up a, uh, a small helium balloon prior to flight to see exactly where the wind starts to travel and, and which direction it takes you and roughly what its speed is. He uses a stopwatch. Uh, or sometimes just dead reckoning, but um, so it's easy to go up a few thousand feet in a balloon, but uh, you, you might not like what you find up there. So for most of the passenger flights, a uh, thousand feet, I'd say, is probably the maximum. You also need to maintain good visibility of the ground. So if there happened to be any kind of you know low cloud or fog or any of that, well, you probably you may not go up. But even if you were to encounter that, uh, it's best to stay as low as possible. Plus, the uh, excitement of the trip is not ruined by a thousand feet. It's, it's actually a perfectly good altitude. You can still see everything pretty clearly. And you're still among nature, you know. Most of the trees in this area are not, you know, of that height, so. You still get a fair amount of flight even at lower um, altitudes, whether Rogers take you in and grab some uh, leaves off the goddamn top of the tree. Or uh, as you come into land, of course, uh, which takes a while, so that you got to yeah, edge into it. So you spend a little bit of time in both altitude modes. You see here, they're not putting too much gas into it. They got a pretty good uh, thing. You just you know blasting her once in a while. The animals on the ground don't like that noise. It's a little too disruptive for them. So occasionally, you had to avoid. Uh, certain horse paddocks and that sort of thing just to avoid freaking out the, the animals. But technically speaking, um, because you don't have true control over your direction as far as um, as far as any kind of air transport goes, balloons have the right of way um, because of their lack of uh, directional control. You're, you can turn the balloon in any orientation you want, but it's not going to go that direction. It only goes downwind. So if you do happen to land in a farmer's field or whatever, they can't sue you or they, you know, it's, they can't do much about it. Um, Dad always had uh, gift certificates and whatnot to give to anybody who might be a little bit upset about the, you know, so <laughs> that's how he tackled it, which was he didn't bring money. He brought, you know, free balloon rides, hoping to, you know, potentially just convert the, uh, convert the person over to the concept, you know. I wasn't on these particular flights, but actually there was a couple of times in which people shot at uh, the balloon. Um, it's illegal. But, um, and it, it wasn't known whether they were actually aiming at the balloon, but they were definitely trying to call it off. And, and because you can't, there's nothing you can do when you're over a property. There's absolutely no way that you can uh, respond to that. Except with return fire, but... I don't think anything actually legal came of that particular uh, issue, but uh, Dad was saying they heard the bullets flying by anyway, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't like they were way out. They weren't blanks anyway. So anyway, this is where one section of the um, thing ends. I thought it was kind of a neat little in the sun kind of deal. And then uh, what's coming up next is uh, just a little bit of the landing sequence. Uh, it doesn't involve all of the recovery or anything, but it shows a particularly good landing in that it comes down, stays upright, and obviously the wind wasn't strong enough to push the balloon over and knock the balloon or knock the basket over. So that's what we'll get into here in a sec. Here's where I think the two flights are different times a day, uh, but uh, here's Dave Duvall again. So. It's hard to tell. They, it might just be out of sequence. So here they're peering on the landing field, it would seem. There's uh, some of the cows I was talking about. I'm sure despite the getting freaked out by the noise, it must have looked like quite the sight. Oh, I see he's going to land in this pre-field here. That looks like a perfect place to go. 
So there, you can see um, Bloom came down and stayed upright, which is good. If there's enough wind, it will uh, pull you over and, and basket will go down as well. So he keeps giving her fire. And you're going to see him reach for the, uh, at some point not too soon here, there's a red rope I told you about that goes up to the circular patch in the top there, which is where all the hot air is getting captured. And he'll pull that out and then the bloom will come down and uh, he'll start to deflate pretty quickly. Now he's probably trying to do that such that he'll it'll deflate in the right direction that he wants. Here he goes. So he's yanking the fuck out of that. That'll pull out that, uh, I called it a pair, I should have looked up, but it's, it's a big, huge circular patch in the top. It's held on by Velcro. And it's held in there by air pressure. So, yeah, there you can see it start to uh, escape. Going out the top. And there you can see that big patch is not, it's not seated up in the top. Now on the front there, there's a huge crown line. It's called the crown line. It's a big rope that's attached right to the very, very, very top there in a in an eyelet. You can kind of see it going up with the rest of it. If you're an unfortunate motherfucker, sometimes you've got a hold of that thing and you're trying to uh, stretch out the balloon so that it'll get rid of all of its leftover. But there's still enough lift left on the top of that to easily lift me and probably even lift the back end of a truck. So yeah, I've, had, I've, I've been lifted off the ground and dragged along by that to by that thing. Uh, once that happens, like you get a couple of guys on it. And it's a little bit like tug of war. So you're pulling on that, trying to get the air out so you can get it in a position where you can re repack the balloon. So dad's right there at the center point. That's where the crown line is. Not those ribs that he's got, but uh, yeah, and there's Roger just dismantling the, the balloon and uh, the van would be on its way and uh, probably not too far and ready to come and recover this and help uh, wrap it back up and pack it. There's Dad being useful. He, he was always, you know, obviously wanting to make sure things went good. And I don't know if I have any footage, but afterward everybody goes back to the clubhouse and uh, you have a glass of champagne. It's a tradition after having uh, ballooned, after ha having a flight. And uh, quite often people want to sit around there and gab for quite a while, like maybe an hour or more. And uh, Roger was always, Roger and Dad were both always uh, kind of keen on that, knowing that added to the experience. And it wasn't just the, you know, okay, thanks for the balloon, get it, get out. You know, it, uh, it, people really wanted to talk about it after the fact. It was something that, uh, you know, pretty much nobody has ever experienced before. <clears throat> they had, they themselves hadn't experienced before, so <clears throat> everyone was quite, uh, quite willing to talk. So we're getting close to the end of this here. Um, I've got some other sections of this video that I'll do something different with, but I wanted to do the commentary one first. We will talk soon. Thanks for watching. And I will be back uh, with some other uh, balloon-related stuff. Take care. Bye.